So we'll just pick up here in chapter 13, and we will just go through the, uh, the slides here uh, until uh, we get to the end. So we're starting off here with uh, our introduction to chemical equilibria. Uh, I do expect you to know the difference between a static and a, a dynamic equilibrium. So that could be a uh, fairly short, uh, like a multiple choice question or a true false question or something like that. Uh, just understanding uh, when you have something that is static, you have forces that are in equilibrium, but nothing is moving. Dynamic equilibrium, uh, there is no overall change in the system, but stuff is still happening. That's a uh, dynamic equilibrium. So here we're just uh, introducing how dynamic equilibria come into play in chemical reactions and relating it to what we talked about in the last chapter, which was kinetics. And then this is all leading up to our KEQ, or KC as we later called it, the uh, equilibrium constant. Uh, and I've already mentioned that I do for sure expect you to be able to write uh, equilibrium constants if I give you a uh, chemical reaction. And I also expect you to understand uh, these general points here that it's talking about. So again, these could be fairly easy multiple choice or two false type questions, just generally understanding what's happening at equilibrium. Okay, and so this is just kind of uh, reiterating the same stuff there. So again, be able to write equilibrium expressions. So that's some practice problems there that we did. Uh, I also expect you to be able to understand what K tells you about a reaction. So if I give you a K value and I ask you at equilibrium, is this equilibrium uh, going to highly favor the reactants or the products or neither? you should be able to tell me that. So if K is much larger than one, that is going to highly favor uh, the products. If K is much smaller than one, remember K can't be negative. Um, it can be less than one, but it cannot be negative. Um, so if it's less than, uh, much less than one, then that would be highly favoring the reactants. And if it's fairly close to one, that means that it's not really favoring either one. And if I ask you to answer something like that, I will be fairly clear. Like, it should be pretty clear that, okay, this either is favoring one or favoring the other or not favoring. So if I give you something like 1.025, like, that's really darn close to one. Like, you should recognize, okay, it's not really favoring. Like, technically speaking, yes, it is very slightly favoring the products, but that's essentially one. Like that is, that's not really favoring either one. Uh, when I say it's much greater than one or much less than one, I'm thinking like, uh, you know, at, at the smallest, a hundred or greater and like 0 0.001 or, or something like it's, it needs to be pretty far away from one before I would say, okay, it is highly product favored or highly reactant favored. I've asked a few questions like this in exams in the past, and you know I've I've given a number kind of like this one, and so many students will answer and say, "Oh, it's product favored." You know, it's greater than one. It's like, well, yes, but it's not really <laughs> favoring the products. It's like saying, you know, you 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 have a thousand Cheerios and your friend has a thousand and one Cheerios. You know, your friend has more Cheerios than you. Well, technically, yes, but it's pretty much the same. I don't know why Cheerios came to mind. Anyway, moving on. Uh, talking about gases uh, and how we deal with those, um, I do expect you to be able to write uh, Kp instead of Kc since it is literally exactly the same, just with pressures instead of concentrations. Um, so there's not really any reason you shouldn't be able to write Kp. Uh, and since you are taking this at home as well, you should be able to convert between these two. Um, since you will have access to this equation, uh, you should be able to convert between Kp and Kc. 
it's not difficult to do. Really the only hard part is just remembering how to find delta N, which is just uh, the change in the number of gas molecules uh, from reactants to products. So if you have, uh, let's see, we don't really have an example there, but uh, like here we had three moles uh, versus two, and so our delta N was uh, negative one. We lost a mole of gas. So delta N back in our equation here was negative one. So just uh, keep that in mind. Uh, heterogeneous equilibria, we talked about this just a minute ago, but I'll mention it again here. Uh, if you have solids or pure liquids, they are not going to show up in the equilibrium uh, expression. Let's see, it's kind of the same stuff there. Uh, this is just more talking about the equilibrium constant and how it doesn't change uh, regardless of the starting point. So we kind of already talked about that. Okay, so now we're getting into more of actually solving problems here. Uh, and so this is where we get into kind of our two different possibilities. Uh, we can either uh, be given an equilibrium concentration and use that to find uh, the changes which then allow us to find the equilibrium concentrations for everything else. So that is definitely a possibility. And the other possibility is if we're not given an equilibrium concentration and instead we're given Kc. And actually I kind of forgot to mention back here, usually when we're given an equilibrium concentration, it doesn't have to be the case, but usually we're trying to find Kc um, when we're given an equilibrium concentration. And so our kind of two options here are have an equilibrium concentration and find Kc, or have Kc and find an equilibrium concentration. Um, and so those are usually our, our two possibilities when we're doing these kinds of problems. And so if you're not given an equilibrium concentration, you'll be using uh, an unknown value x in your ice table to work out uh, what those equilibrium concentrations must be and then solving uh, to get uh, your, your answer. Sometimes you'll have to use the quadratic equation, uh, sometimes you won't. Uh, it just depends on the way the question is written. But uh, since I gave you extended time on the exam, you should be able to uh, to do any of those maths that you need to do. Okay. Uh, and there, there will be, if I remember correctly, there is an example of both of those kinds of questions on the exam. Uh, at least one. Um, where I give you an equilibrium concentration and you need to find Kc. And there's uh, another one where I give you Kc and you find uh, an equilibrium concentration. Now it is possible that uh, you could uh, use the x is small assumption Uh, to find some of those values. Um, I believe when I was writing those questions, just because I was trying to save you all time, um, I believe the way I wrote them was that if it doesn't specify, you don't have to worry about checking to make sure the x is small assumption is correct. Um, so any question where you can't use the x is small assumption, I tell you that you can't use the x is small assumption. Uh, when it gets to the next chapter where we do stuff with acids, base, uh, acids and bases, 
I believe everything uh, just involves uh, using the excess small assumption. I don't think that there's any cases there where um, you can't use the excess small assumption. Uh, but any question for this stuff here, <coughs> I tell you in the question itself, don't use the excess small assumption. <coughs> and so if you're doing a question where you have these unknowns with x uh, and you get some kind of complicated algebra, um, especially in some cases you might not even be able to use the quadratic formula if it's, if it's especially complex in terms of its algebra. Um, unless I specifically tell you otherwise, you can use the x's small assumption. And remember that only gets rid of these minus x's and plus x's. It does not get rid of just the uh, a number times x. Okay. So this is just another example here. We're using the x's small assumption to make the math easier for us. We do a bunch of practice problems there, which I would encourage you to go back and rewatch before we get to our last topic for this chapter, which was Le Chatelier's principle. And so Le Chatelier's principle tells us that uh, if we have uh, something that messes with our equilibrium, the equilibrium is going to shift, uh, and there will be uh, a relatively large question, if I remember correctly, uh, the way that I wrote this question um, I believe the way I wrote the question was I gave you a chemical reaction and then I described or I put in multiple different options for things that could happen. Um, and then I tell, I have you tell me whether that pushes the equilibrium to the left or whether it pushes the equilibrium to the right. Um, I believe that was the way that the question was written. It could be slightly differently than that. Uh, the question could be written essentially where um, I give you, I will always give you the equation for sure. I'll give you the equation and I'll, I'll, I'll describe it. Like I'll tell you if it's exothermic or endothermic. Um, but I, it could be phrased f slightly differently. Like it could say, you know, select all the ones below that push the reaction to the right. Um, and so you would essentially be doing the same thing. You would just not be clicking on things that would push it to the left. Uh, but it's, it's the same idea, but it might just be written slightly differently. But there will, for sure, be a question on the exam about Le Chatelier's principle, where I will give you an equation, I will describe the reaction, and then you will have to tell me, um, either by clicking on things that push the reaction in one direction, uh, or writing in, you know, left, right, something like that. Um, you'll have to tell me which direction the reaction or the equilibrium is going to be pushed by that thing. Um, or maybe you'll have to tell me, you know, it doesn't actually change it at all. Because again, remember that is a possibility. Um, some things that we do don't actually affect the equilibrium. Uh, so there will be a question over Le Chatelier's principle on the exam. It's just more Le Chatelier's principle stuff. Excuse me. Um, the catalysis um, really is just what I say here. That's all you need to know. Uh, just that catalysis don't actually affect the equilibrium. They just get you there faster. So that's what it's uh, describing here. That's all I expect you to know from that. Okay. Let's move on to chapter 14. So 14 is all about acid-base chemistry and their equilibria. I start off here talking about uh, the different definitions. I don't believe I put anything in for the Arrhenius definition because we don't normally use that one. Uh, but you do need to know the Bronsted-Lowry definition. Uh, I do expect you to know that. So an acid is a proton donor, a base is a proton acceptor. And not only should you know the definition, you should be able to identify acids and bases in chemical reactions. Uh, I do believe that there are a couple 
uh, questions on the exam. And again, it's been a little while since I've written this exam, but I, I think I remember writing at least a couple questions where I give you an equation, I give you an acid-base reaction, and I have you label this is the acid, this is the base, this is the conjugate acid, this is the conjugate base. So I do believe you will have to label stuff like that. For sure you will at some point have to label this is acting as an acid, this is acting as a base. I don't remember if I have you label all four in the same one or not, uh, but you should be able to, for sure. You should be able to label the acid, the base, the conjugate base, and the conjugate acid. So just remember, when you're trying to figure out what's what, determine what's giving up the proton, the H+, plus, and what is accepting the proton, the H+. Plus. So the nitrous acid here, you wouldn't necessarily know that was nitrous acid, it's just H and O2, but you can see that it loses an H+. Plus. It goes from H and O2 to just NO2-, minus. so because it is losing, H plus, it is donating H plus, that would be the acid, and so therefore by definition, the thing it turns into is the conjugate base. The acid always turns into the base, and the base always turns into the acid. So you should be able to figure those out. That's just more of the same thing there. Uh, this is talking about the definition of strong versus weak versus negligible acids. I do expect you to know that as well. So strong acids are completely dissociated in water. Weak acids only partially dissociate. And then negligible acids don't dissociate really at all. This is just talking more about relative strong versus weak. Uh, now we're getting into the auto-ionization of water which is kind of be, this is going to be our key to the acid-base equilibria stuff. Uh, and so you should know how to uh, use this equilibrium here. The H plus times OH minus is equal to 1 times 10 to the negative 14. You should be able to use that to uh, to solve for either of those concentrations, either H plus or OH minus, which is what we do here in some of these practice problems. So if I give you H plus or I give you OH minus, you should be able to solve for the other one. And I do believe there's a couple questions like that on the exam, where it is just as simple as that. I just give you one and I ask you to find the other. All right, which leads us naturally into the pH scale as well kind of similar to what we just talked about. You should definitely, definitely know how to use this equation. You will be finding pHs on the exam, I guarantee it. Some of them will just be as simple as uh, what we did here, essentially just I give you the H plus and you tell me the pH. Uh, or maybe I'll give you the OH minus and you find me the pH. Uh, but you'll also be using that um, in, in conjunction with ice tables later on uh, where you'll find H plus at equilibrium and use that to find the pH. So you will be finding pHs on the exam for sure. So make sure you're very comfortable uh, knowing how to do that. You should be able to, to find a pH you know, pretty quick. Uh, you don't want to have to spend a lot of time uh, you know, flipping through the book to find the equation. For example, you, you should be able to, to do it very quickly. Okay. So this is just talking about uh, some other stuff there. Uh, the pOH, uh, you should be able to find pOHs as well. If you remember, the, the pOH is the same as the pH, just uh, with OH minus instead of H plus. Uh, and those are related to each other, as you can see there. So pH plus pOH is equal to 14. So you should be able to uh, use one to find the other. Uh, as far as measuring the pH, uh, I'm not going to test you over like you know, you're trying to measure the pH in this certain situation, what kind of stuff should you use? There's not going to be anything like that. 
This is more just an FYI stuff here, talking about indicators versus litmus papers uh, versus pH meters. Um, I guess I would expect you to know that pH meters are the most accurate. Um, that is the most accurate way to measure the pH. But other than that, I'm not going to, to ask you anything. Um, I just expect you to know that pH meters are better than litmus paper. Because <laughs> litmus papers are very much just a, a yes-no thing. Uh, and pH meters actually do give you a number. Okay, uh, I do expect you to know the seven strong acids and the uh, six, I guess it is, strong bases. Um, I do expect you to know those. Um, if this was an exam on campus, you would have to have them memorized. Uh, but since you will have your book with you when you're taking this exam, I guess you won't necessarily have to have them memorized. You can just look at the list. Uh, but I do expect you to recognize them so that if I just tell you, you know, you have 0.1 molar lithium hydroxide, what's the pH? You should recognize, oh, that's a strong base. I don't need to do any equilibrium stuff. All of that is going to turn into OH minus. Um, so you'll still need to be able to recognize it and know what to do with it. Uh, and don't forget that these three here will double whatever the concentration is uh, for OH minus, since they have two OHs. So if this was not LiOH, if it was strontium hydroxide, you would end up with 0.2 OH, um, since you get two of them for each one. Okay, and so then that leads us into what if we have weak acids, not a strong one. And it gets into what we spent a lot of time in this chapter talking about, which is weak acid, weak base equilibria. Uh, it's actually a simpler version of the same stuff we did in the last chapter, um, where we will either have Ka, and again we call it Ka because it's for an acid, uh, instead of Kc. So we'll either have Ka, and we'll use that to find the equilibrium concentration, and therefore the pH, or we'll be given the pH and we'll use that to find Ka. So again, those are kind of our, our two possibilities uh, for what we, we could be looking for here. So I'm not going to belabor this too much in going through, because we spent quite a bit of time on these slides in the videos themselves. Uh, but there will, for sure, be questions on the exam where I will just tell you something like uh, like this. It'll just be very minimal information um, where maybe I give you the pH and then ask you to find the Ka, or I could flip that and say you have this concentration of nitrous acid, what's the pH? Um, so either way, you should be able to do it and there will be questions like that on the exam. Uh, and again, just like I mentioned earlier, Unless I specifically tell you not to, feel free to use the x is small assumption for, uh, for those questions where you use x, or use the unknown. Okay, uh, pHs of mixtures. Uh, if I give you a mixture, if you remember what we talked about in the, uh, in the lecture videos, uh, all you have to do is figure out which acid is stronger and then ignore the weak one. And so really the only difference here is just one little step at the beginning to figure out which one is stronger and then ignore the weak one from that point forward. And so it's essentially a single acid problem just like uh, all the other ones we've done. Just now you're, you have something to ignore. Uh, polyprotic acids, kind of the same thing. Just uh, figure out which deprotonation is the strongest uh, and that should be the only one that you have to worry about and I will just tell you now if I give you a polyprotic acid to work with on the exam you're only going to be doing one deprotonation. Um, I know you did multiples like we did a multiple in the lecture videos and I think you did one in the homework as well uh, but it's too long of a question to put on an exam for me to have you doing two deprotonations. 
where you have one deprotonation that just leads into a second one, so you end up with two ice tables. Um, you should be able to do that because uh, you needed to do that for the homework and uh, we, we talked about doing that. We did an example of that in the lecture videos, uh, but it's just too long of a process for the exam. And so I could give you a polyprotic acid, but I would expect you to recognize that you just need to look at the first uh, strongest deprotonation, not um, all of the deprotonations. Let's see what that question was real quick. Uh, deprotonation, uh, it's just the the molecule acting as an acid, essentially. Um, so each of these, Ka1, Ka2, Ka3, that is one of those hydrogens popping off and reacting with something. So uh, it's we, we call it a deprotonation because the acid donates a proton. So it is deprotonated because it, it loses that proton. So each time it acts as an acid, that is a, a deprotonation. So you have the, the first deprotonation, the strongest one would be all you would need to worry about. Uh, and so then at that point you would just treat it like a weak acid. You just figure out the, the strongest K, like so for example with sulfurous acid, that's the strongest K, and you would just ignore that one. And you just treat it like a normal weak acid. Uh, weak bases, same kind of deal. It's the exact same mathematical process as weak acids, just you're, you have a slightly different chemical equation that you're working with, um, since you have a base instead of an acid, but you should be able to do that. And I do believe that I put a weak base problem on the exam, I think. I'm not going to go quite so far as to guarantee that I did, because I don't remember for absolutely sure, but I think I did put a weak base problem. Uh, but like I said, it's the process is exactly the same as weak acid. You just have, you know, base instead of an acid, conjugate acid instead of a conjugate base, and OH minus instead of H plus. Um, so you just you're you're working with different molecules, but the the process of the ice table and uh, and finding equilibrium concentrations and all that that's all exactly the same. Okay, uh, so here we talk about the relationship of Ka and Kb. Uh, if you need to convert with those, which I don't think you will, um, I don't remember putting anything like that on the exam. But if if I do, if I did, and I just don't remember that, um, you can come back to this slide and you can find that there. Ka times Kb is equal to Kw, uh, which is just if you remember that's one times ten to the negative fourteen. It's just like H plus and OH minus. Uh, as far as the factors affecting acid strength, so like binary acids, oxy acids, um, uh, the resonance, things like that, uh, I don't believe. believe I put any questions in on this. If I did put a question in that covered these topics, it would have been something just along the lines of, um, you know, what would make an acid more acidic? Like, if, if there's more resonance, it's more acidic. Uh, if the molecule or the, the atom attached to the OH uh, is more electronegative, that makes it more acidic. It would be something simple like that that you could just refer back to the slides to get the answer to. Um, like I said, I don't, I don't think I put anything in on that, but if I did, that would be the extent of it. Uh, Lewis acids, Lewis bases, don't worry about those. I did not put in a question about Lewis acids and Lewis bases. Um, if you take organic chemistry, you'll get your fill of Lewis acids and Lewis bases. I also did not put anything in about acid rain. 
So don't worry about that. Let's go ahead and talk about the last group of slides here. Uh, and so in here, we're going to talk about common ion effect buffers and uh, titrations and solubility. Those are kind of the, the, the main things here, which the common ion effect is essentially just leading into buffers. Um, and so the, uh, the common ion effect is using the Chatelier's principle really to control how an equilibrium uh, shifts, how it moves, what happens with it. Um, and so it's, you know, adding in something extra, essentially adding in something that uh, keeps the equilibrium from moving too far to one side or the other. And so we, uh, we did some practice problems here where we put stuff in. I don't think I put any questions in the exam that are just solely common ion effect. I don't think. Um, but I, I believe I did put some in that are more specifically related to buffers, which we'll get to in just a second. Uh, but uh, you should be comfortable doing something like this, because um, like I said, there will be stuff like this in buffers where you have multiple things here in the initial column of your ice table. Uh, and just like before, unless I specify, you can use the x's small assumption when you're doing stuff like this, which will make your life a whole lot easier, because uh, that can get really complicated if you don't use the x's small assumption. Uh, and so that then leads us into buffers, which, like I said, that's our main topic uh, when it comes to the common ion effect. Uh, and more specifically, uh, buffers in the Hendrus and Hasselbach equation is the really big thing. Uh, but before we get to the Hendrus and Hasselbach, I do expect you to just understand in general how buffers work. And so just very quickly and generally speaking, how a buffer works is you have a significant amount of both a weak acid and its conjugate base. And so any strong acid or strong base that you add into the solution is going to react with one of these instead of reacting with water. So if you add in a strong base, it's going to react with the weak acid. If you add in a strong acid, it's going to react with the weak base. And when it does that, it's going to change the concentration um, and it's going to lose a little bit of one thing and increase a little bit of the the other one way or the other um, so then uh, this small change in acid and base is not going to have nearly as big of a, an effect on the pH uh, as if all of that stuff had either been put directly into OH minus or H plus um, and so the, the buffer limits, uh, the, essentially the buffer molecules are acting like sacrificial uh, molecules uh, to keep the OH and H plus uh, amounts to a minimum. So they are reacted with instead of water being reacted with. Okay, so then that leads us to here, which is our main equation for buffers, the henderson hasselbach which you will be using on the exam. Uh, you will be expected to know how to use the henderson hasselbach and there'll be, oh, at least a couple different questions um, that you will uh, use the henderson hasselbach on on the exam. So make sure you are comfortable using that. Uh, the good news is it's a fairly easy equation to use. Uh, you should be able to use it in the same way that we did here. So like in this question where we had a buffer and we added something to it. Um, and so we worked out, okay, what change happened in our buffer molecules and then plugged those new numbers into the Hendrus and Hasselbach to get uh, the new pH. Um, you should be comfortable doing that.
and you should also be comfortable using the Hendrus and Hasselbach uh, when we get to the titrations uh, in just a second. Uh, for basic buffering systems, I don't remember if I did a basic buffering system. I don't think I did. Uh, but if I did put in a, a basic buffering question, uh, just remember it is exactly the same as an acid buffering. Uh, the only thing that's different is you might have to convert a PKB into a PKA. And that's really all you would all that would be different because the Henderson Hasselbach equation doesn't change just because you're using a buffer uh, that is basic instead of acidic. So it's still the exact same process. Um, you just might have to do one extra thing to get the PKA. Okay. Uh, as far as buffer capacity and range, um, all I expect you to know from this is just that you want your uh, pH that you're buffering at to be within one of the pKa of your acid. And I expect you to know that the, um, the higher the concentration of the buffer, the higher the capacity. So the, the more it uh, is able to buffer. Uh, when it has those higher concentrations. So nothing more specific than that. So I might have you at some point pick out like the best acid to buffer with, um, but I, I don't think I would, I don't think I put any two part questions where like you, you pick out the best buffer and then you also do the calculation as well. I think I, I if I put those in, I would have split them up. Okay, uh, titrations, I know this was a big bugaboo because um, we spent like an entire video just doing one practice problem uh, for titrations. So I want to uh, assuage your fears a little bit here. Um, we will not have a giant titration question. Excuse me. Uh, we will not have a giant titration question on the exam. Instead, what we will have is uh, one or two questions asking you to find the titration at one or two different points in a titration. Uh, so in the in the uh, the slides here, we talk about different points in the titration. Um, and how you find the pH at those different points. So we had initially, we had uh, before the equivalence point when we, it's acting like a buffer. Uh, we talked about at the equivalence point and then beyond the equivalence point. Uh, I will not give you a question where you have to do multiples of these. So I'm not going to give you a question like this one where you have to find the volume, and then you have to find the pH at this point, and then you have to find the pH at this point, and then you have to find the pH at another point. There's not going to be something like that. Um, I will give you questions over titrations, and you will need to find the pH, but it will be just one point, and I will make it as, as simple as possible. Um, sometimes you can see a question and it looks simple at first, but then you realize you have to do a half a dozen preliminary calculations to get the information you need to do that final calculation. I'm not going to do that to you. Um, it will be as simple as possible, um, again, just to, to limit the amount of time that you're spending on each question. Um, when I was writing these, I tried not to write any of them so that they would take like 15 to 20 minutes. If you remember, like I said, this this video or this problem took us an entire video's worth of time, to so it was it was like 20 minutes at least for us to solve this, and that was with me working it, and I knew what I was doing because <laughs> I've done it multiple times. Um, so there's not going to be a question like this on the exam. There might be a question like this one. So there might be part B. Um, where I just say, what's the pH after you add 5 mils of the KOH? Um, uh, and I would point out uh, that you know you haven't reached the equivalence point yet. 
that was kind of the, the point of part A, was to figure out how much, how far we have to go to get to the equivalence point. And so I would point out, you put in 5 mils, and I might even not even tell you 5 mils, I might even just say, what's the pH after you added this many moles of KOH? Just to again make it slightly easier. Because if you remember in part B here, we had to take this 5 mils and work out how many moles of KOH that was. So I will, I will try to make it as simple as possible while still giving you work to do, essentially. So I'm trying to, to gauge whether or not you understand what you're doing, not necessarily, you know, can you do the half a dozen equations uh, that are needed to get to the end point. So there will be questions over titrations, but I will try to keep them as short and simple as possible. Uh, and they will not be multi, multi-step, where you have to do several things just to get the information you need to find that final thing. Um, they might be maybe two-step. Maybe you have to do one calculation and then take that number and plug it into your final. So it could be you know, still relatively simple like that, but it's not going to be like a half a dozen steps to get to the final point. Okay. Uh, and then one other thing that I do expect you to be able to do for titrations is just recognize the titration curve and the regions on a curve. So I could give you a picture like this one, for example. And I might label um, like this and this and this. Like I could label a few different points or areas and ask you to tell me uh, and maybe label, you know, this is the initial, this is the buffer region, and this is the equivalence point. Um, so obviously I would have that, you know, blocked out so you couldn't see it. Um, so I expect you to be able to very, very generally point out the regions on a, on a titration curve. But um, like I said before, you're not going to be drawing any. Okay, uh, titrations of polyprotic, nothing like that on there. Um, monitoring the pH, kind of similar to what I said about uh, pH meters and stuff. Like, I, I'm not going to have questions over this, over phenolphthalein, um, different kinds of indicators. I'm not going to have you picking indicators, nothing like that. Uh, so then the last thing here... I know it's it's a lot. Um, exam two is a big exam. Uh, is uh, solubility products. So this is just equilibria as it relates to solubility. And just like the previous ones, you pretty much just have two options. Either I give you KSP and you find a concentration, or I tell you concentrations and you find KSP. Those are really the, the two options. Uh, it's just going to look a little bit different because the only thing we will ever have is an equation like this where it's just two concentrations or maybe we'll have one where one of them is uh, squared like uh, let's see like this one here so that would end up being squared because you have two CL minuses but um, that really is just it's the same process that we've done in the previous equilibria just with this very particular kind of reaction uh, and so there will be questions on the exam where you will uh, find KSP from concentrations I, th I think I gave you one of each if I remember correctly I think I gave you one where you find KSP from a concentration and one where you find concentration from KSP and just like previous ones I tried to keep it as simple as possible um, so don't expect anything tricky if if you look at a problem and you think to yourself okay that was too easy he wouldn't have given something that easy no it's entirely possible I give you something that easy um, it'll be it'll be something similar to like what we did here what we did in the in the practice problems um, and so if, if it's a very similar process to what we did in those practice problems, then that's probably, you're probably on the right path. 
Uh, as far as what affects solubility, the only thing I expect you to know is that the pH can affect the solubility. So can the presence of complex ions. Um, and that's really it. Like I, I'm not going to have you like picking out, you know, if I put in this particular complex ion, is that going to have an effect on the solubility? I'm not going to expect you to know that. I just expect you to know that in general, the pH and the presence of complex ions can have an effect on solubility. And don't worry about this uh, selective precipitation. I'm not going to ask you anything about that. Whew. Okay, so that was a lot. And I fully realized that was a lot. But try to, uh, to keep in mind, no, they're just, they're super hyped about Paw Patrol. <laughs> And really, I think it's more just they, they kind of get bored with Paw Patrol after a little while, and so then they, they start messing with each other. But anyway, uh, yeah, that was my kids. Uh, that, so that I know that was a lot. There's a lot of stuff in Exam 2, but uh, try to, to think of it and try to realize that the majority of it is just variations on a single theme. Like the vast, vast majority of what we talked about uh, in those topics was just manipulating equilibria. It's all just variations on that equilibrium constant expression and finding the different parts. Uh, doing it with just regular chemical equations, doing it with acid base, doing it with uh, solubility. So the majority of that was just variations on the same thing. And so even though it was a lot of individual topics, they're all very, very closely related. Um, so hopefully it won't feel quite as overwhelming um, with, with that in mind. Uh, so questions. Uh, yes, I have curved exams in the past, but I never guarantee a curve. Um, it has to be a, a, a fairly extraordinary circumstance. Um, so like if I, if I get an exam back, um, obviously if, if I feel like there is an issue with the exam that was my fault, then I curve it for sure then, because it's it's not, it's nothing that uh, happened because of you all. And that has happened in the past where um, I've written an exam and I realized afterwards that maybe one of the questions was very poorly written uh, and was confusing. And so then at that point, you know, I have to ask myself, okay, did the people that got this wrong, did they get it wrong because they didn't know the chemistry or did, did they get it wrong because they didn't understand the question because it wasn't well written? Uh, and so in cases like that, um, I have curved, you know, th those would be relatively small curves. Um, if the entire class uh, does poorly, that generally tells me that it's probably an issue with the exam, not an issue <coughs> with uh, student performance. Um, and if, if your thought right now is, okay, I need to send out an email to all the other students, tell them to all do really badly, and so that way we get a curve, no, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> that's a terrible idea. Don't do that. <coughs> uh, number one, it's dishonest. Anything dishonest is a terrible idea. Uh, number two, everybody's not going to intentionally do poorly on the exam with the hope of getting a curve. Uh, there will be multiple people that are honest and will do well and you're just going to end up with a really bad score compared to that. So if that crossed your mind, hopefully it very quickly left your mind. Um, uh, okay, see you Haley. Um, I'll, I'll put this up on, on YouTube as soon as I'm done here. Um, so if there's anything important from this point forward, you can, you can catch it later. Um, so 
don't uh, don't think okay uh, I don't need to worry too much because there's probably going to be a curve because I assume everyone else is going to do poorly don't make that assumption um, it's a bad assumption um, let's see Stop sharing for a minute. So, um, so yeah, if if everyone does poorly, like I've I've had a few exams in the past where uh, literally no one got an A on the exam. Like the high score was maybe like a an eighty eight or an eighty seven or something like that. And if, if nobody gets an A, that's a pretty good, uh, you know, and if it's a decent sized class, like if there's if there's very, very few students, you know, maybe it's possible that just no one gets an A. But when it's a decent sized class and nobody gets an A, that's a pretty good sign that the there's an issue with the exam itself. And so then I will curve. Um, so it just, it depends on the situation. That's a to, to answer your simple question with a very long answer. <laughs> it depends on the situation, but I have done it in the past, but by no means do I guarantee curves. Uh, other questions? Relaxing the taste. Let's try it. I believe your answer. I actually got my first shot of the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, is that a week? No, it wasn't a week ago. It was, uh, it was almost two weeks ago, I guess. Almost two weeks ago. It was not last Wednesday, but the Wednesday before. Um, I got my first shot of the Pfizer. Uh, I kind of got it at the last second. I had my normal yearly. Uh, checkup uh, with my primary care physician, just my, my wellness checkup, because my birthday, I, I usually try to have it around my birthday. Um, and I went in, and he he checked me over, and he said, everything looks good, have you got the shot? And I was like, no, I tried, couldn't find any. And he's like, oh, well, let me see. And uh, I guess they, they had some supply. Um, he's with Warren Clinic, and so they had, uh, they had one shot left for that day, or one spot anyway, um, one open uh, time slot for that day, and so I was able to go in that day and get it that afternoon. So yeah, I had the shot um, the first day or so afterwards. It felt like a normal vaccine, like you know any any normal shot. You know your arm's a little sore. Um, strangely enough, like a week later, my arm got really sore for like one day, and honestly, I'm not actually sure if that was because of the vaccine. It could have been something else, because I've never heard of, like, having normal soreness, like, feeling completely normal, and then, like, a week later, getting sore again. Like, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure why that happened. It could have been just something completely, completely unrelated, but it cleared up after, like, 24 hours. Um, but yeah, I'll, so I'll get my second shot in about a week. On the uh, on April Fool's Day, actually, <laughs> get my second shot. Yeah, sudden onset soreness. It was very strange. Like it, like my arm wasn't really sore at all, and then all of a sudden it was really, or my shoulder wasn't really sore at all, and all of a sudden it was really sore for like one day, and then it was gone again. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I didn't get any bruises or anything. It was like I said the. 24 hours or so after I got the shot, it was like a normal vaccine. It was like the flu shot or or a tetanus shot or anything like that. Yeah, I've heard the second one is worse too from a few of my friends that have gotten it. But some of them had the Moderna, not uh, not Pfizer. So I'm not I'm not 100% sure on that. So I had I had Pfizer. I heard that, uh, and again, this is completely unrelated. And I guess I can stop the recording for now. I don't think there's any more questions about the uh, the exam. So I'll go ahead and stop the recording. So bye, people on YouTube.